And that's what we want our kids to do, see who they are and see who they are represented in Jesus Christ. So, start the sermon over again. Amen? All right. Or some could say, no, you're finished. You're done. See you later. All right? Uh-huh. Sure. No. So, grace and truth. As I talked with the kids, I wanted to begin to see our identity in Jesus Christ. The truth of we, who we are is found in Jesus. And we talked about this biblical worldview that said there's a standard that God wants to carry out. God gives that standard. God delivers that standard in Scripture. God gives that standard in the person of Jesus Christ by revelation. And it allows us to see that these spiritual truths are true because they correspond to reality. Now, the cultural worldview that we're talking about is one that holds that you are the truth. You hold truth to yourself. And, in fact, you self-determine your truth. It all results in who you are and what you want to see and how you view things. The biblical worldview is that, yes, we do begin to use our mind, our intellect, and our reason, our experience, and our emotions. We use all those things we realize they're there, and we do so so that we can discern what is true and to see how I'm going to determine it. So we may utilize all these things that a cultural worldview says we should use, and I want us to use study and experience and reason and all those sorts of things, but we start with God first of all. We have to make sure we get those in order. We tend to sometimes keep them backwards. Sometimes you hear someone say this, well, the God I believe in is, and they fill in the blank. What we have to be careful of is that suddenly God becomes whatever box you want to put God into. you got to understand that the point of faith isn't to determine who God is, but to let God change who you are. Okay? That's the point of faith, to give God to move in your life and change who you are. In the Old Testament, it happened lots of times that they would go and they would make these idols and create them. They remember that when uh, the people came out of Egypt, they made the golden calf. That was an idol, and they called it idolatry. And, and see, that's a true human condition. As humans, we're always going to look for a God somewhere. And we're usually going to put it in what image we want it to be in to fit our needs. The Christian worldview is that God enters the world and speaks to us what that truth is. Through the person of Jesus, through the scriptures, through divine revelation in that way. See, objective reality is really outside of us. Okay? And it does need to be experienced in God and become real in our lives. But for the truth, it begins with the nature and the character of God. That's where it starts. One reason we come and we worship is not only to give worship and glory to God, not only to to be encouraged and be lifted up and ready to go for next week, but also to see how God reveals himself to us when we've experienced it. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, Christianity claims to give an account of facts, to tell you what the real universe is like. Now, if Christianity is untrue, then no honest person will want to believe it, however helpful it might be. No matter how helpful Christianity is, no one wants to believe it if it's untrue. But if it is true, every honest person will want to believe those things, even if it sometimes gives them no help at all. The point that he's saying is, even though it may become a struggle, we still want to believe it if it's true. And we believe that what God has given us is true. So we'll dive into Understanding that, uh, as we talked about understanding the truth, how we handle that truth. We talked about last week what love is required to handle that truth. But this week we're going to talk about not only is the love that's required of this, how we handle it when that truth gets uh, dismissed or seen as a hardship to us, as others say we should be treated. So let's pray. God, help us to be truly committed to your truth and living in your grace and knowing who you are and what you do. God, I ask that uh, you would help us to see our identity deeply rooted in who you are. And not only will we see our identity in who you are, but how as we live out that truth and that identity, that we would then uh, do so in a way that shows the love of Jesus to you. Take this sermon and make it yours and not mine. Take the folks that gather here. Take the hardships in our lives and turn them into good. Allow them to hear your word. Take the joys of our lives and allow them to be used for your glory and allow them to hear what you're talking about, speaking to us today, so they can use it in their lives. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the kids. Who are you?
of what you would say. And a lot of things I would say were very different. I know that when I moved here at, at this church uh, 15 years ago, I definitely had more brown hair when I first started. Okay? And I don't know if that's kids or a building project or some of you. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, don't know who and exactly why that is or just plain old age. But definitely my hair looks very different now than it did when I first got here. We all change over time. And sometimes we do get caught up on that outside persona of who we are. And sometimes even the outside way we may act or the way we want to you know, present ourselves in the world. I mean, we want cool ladies that we, well, I don't have to worry about looking cool because I never have them. But, uh, well, at least it's like we have it all together. But you and I both know that it doesn't have it all together. So we have to be able to say, who are we? How are we seeing one another? And I want to let you know that if you're a follower of Jesus, you're turned around from a life that follows your own image. Okay? It's no longer you that you follow. It's you've chosen to follow Jesus. You're a Christ follower. If you have seen your life and say, I need to have my life transformed by Jesus and, and admit that I'm sinful and follow Jesus, then you become a Christ follower. That becomes your identity. You understand that your identity is in Christ. You're a disciple of Jesus. Our mission is that we're to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Now, that identity, I think, follows us and allows us to see what we represent Christ on an everyday basis. Remember when I was a youth pastor, I used to uh, uh, take kids on events, uh, much like what Micah does here, only he does a much better job than I ever did. And usually when we go on those events some places, we would have the church bus in some way, and we go to a restaurant somewhere, stop to get food along the way or something like that. And I always had this little speech that I would give to the kids. I'd say, now when you go into the restaurant, remember this, that you represent not only Christ, but also this church. So don't embarrass us by the way you act in there. And usually that was given to me because I would throw food or who knows what would happen. But uh, uh, we just didn't want people to say, did you see that youth group that came in here and trashed the place? You know? Plus, the name of the church was on the bus and so was the phone number. And I really didn't want to get their phone calls later on uh, to the senior pastor of what had happened. Okay? But the thing is, when you walk out of this door, people know you did a job by name too. And the way you act, the way you conduct business, the way you live, represents not only Delphi UNT, and really I'm not as concerned about Delphi UNT as I am concerned about how we represent Christ. Okay? And so we're called to represent Christ in a good manner. And, and so here's a spiritual truth. We follow spiritual group truth, not just because they're better, not just because they're, they're qualitatively better than other truths, but because they are true. And, and, and it helps us truly become who God wants us to be. So understand that your identity in Christ is a part of what forms you, and the spiritual truth forms who you are is the first step of this. Now, that's the first step. How do we deepen our roots to become an image bearer of the King? See, when we call ourselves Christians, I believe we have a responsibility to move deeper into that perspective. I remember when I was in middle school. Um, I was in a, actually a junior high back in those days, and I decided to join the band. Now, a high school band was one of those bands that was really a uh, really, really good band in the state. They were one of the top bands in the state. Not necessarily marching. Marching wasn't our thing. It was that concert and symphonic thing that we did so well at. And that, that's kind of where that band was. Mr. Fred was the director. I was good friends with his son, John. At the time, John later moved to Conley, and he and I didn't connect as much until Texas Days on my Instagram thing when everyone else read Facebook. And, uh, uh, but the point is that that band had a reputation. Not only did it have a reputation, but you expected to perform at a certain level. So at the middle school, the junior high level, they began to say, here's what to do. Here's how you – there was a mantra. There was a discussion. There was an expectation that we're going to come up to a certain level, and we're going to work hard to get there. And we were always doing music one or two steps above us. And I remember sitting there band saying, why are we doing this? It's too hard. And the point was, we do this so that later on we can be doing exactly what we need to be doing at that top level. When we follow Christ, we can do so in a way that is independent. And we follow it with that king vision. And so we do that, we go to deepen roots so we can love and serve. See, deepening our roots as image bearer of the king really is so that we can love and serve because that's what God did when Jesus came to earth was to love and to serve. Now, what is love? See, in the cultural view, we would often say love may be this. Love is to allow anyone to do anything what they want and allow them just to be able to operate in any way they want to. Love means that you don't really put boundaries on anyone or anything. It's free choice. You just figure out what you're doing. Well, let's stop and think about that concept in the way of parenting, okay? Now, parents, you know what this is like. Sometimes 
if you just let a child do as they wish and just help them however way possible, does that mean that you really love them? I mean, think of Ricky. By the way, if anyone's name is Ricky here, I apologize. But think of Ricky, okay? You see Ricky. Ricky's mom says, don't hit your sister. Is that okay, Ricky? He asked Ricky's permission if it's okay to not hit his sister. Does that work, parents? Think about it, okay? And next thing is, Ricky doesn't do that. Ricky, do you want to sit in time out? You're asking the kid permission to sit in time out? Ricky, would you please listen to what I say? Meanwhile, Ricky is running around, pulling his sister's hair, not sitting in time out, and you would think the child has total hearing loss by not listening to the parent at all. Have you ever seen that kind of thing? Okay? See, we understand what that's like. We've seen that. We've seen that kind of that, that image that, that we get the sense of Ricky needs boundaries, and he's not hitting them, and he could have bad consequences because he doesn't have boundaries. And that, some would say, that's pride. Okay? I don't believe so. Instead, love is more walking with people as they go through their lives, teaching them what boundaries are, and walking with them when they have the consequences of their actions outside that boundary. Okay? In other words, you will love someone exactly where they are, but knowing that they may sometimes get off of where they should be, why? Because we've all been there and still loving them in the midst of that and walking them even at that moment in time. See, spiritual growth is something that I believe is key for us. It's not like some sort of Dr. Oz or Dr. Phil or Oprah daytime programming. Instead, we approach it in a way that says we need to understand who God is and what God is doing. See, it's a process of transformation from who we are into the person God created us to be. And we have to learn the truths of the Bible and live accordingly. Bill Hybels tells the story of, of the Louisiana prison system. Uh, the Louisiana prison system is one of the toughest prison systems in the country. If you go in the Louisiana prison system, the recidivism rate is very high, and it's a very, very tough prison system. One gentleman was called to be a warden of a particular prison. In fact, it happened to be the worst prison in Louisiana. It happened to be the one that all the folks who were the murderers and the ones who really would you know, cause lots of problems. Gangs and groups in that prison had so many deaths each year. It was just a bad, bad prison. And the guy they appointed to it was ready to retire in five more years. Okay? And you think, why would you do that? Wouldn't you raise the level and then go, I want to have the easy prison to go out on. Okay? But instead, this guy took hard prison. Within two years, he had totally changed the game. That's what he did. He armed the men, but he also brought in godly principles and taught them an amazing and godly thing. Bill Hybels went down to go to one of their worship experiences, and, and when he was there, he couldn't believe it because he had the chance to teach, but then they had a time when they sang, kind of like what we do here, and he was sitting down front. And he turned around and he looked behind him in a room filled with about 150 guys, and they were singing praise songs like we were, and their hands were up, and they were praising God, and tears were coming down their faces. And he just had to say something. Because he said, those who are forgiven much, much more. And he just stopped. You see, sometimes, sometimes we tend to miss this idea that we have been forgiven. And God wants us to do great things. So if we grow in grace and truth and what we're meant to do, we need to do so in a way that gives glory to God because we're no different than the men who were in that prison in that prison system. So what do we do? What happens if you're standing for truth and you get a roadblock? How do you handle disagreement? Well, I think there's some great scriptural uh, uh, ideas here. First of all, James 1, 2-4 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. See, we can see this here, that the testing of faith gives a perseverance that helps us be stronger. Our faith ends up stronger as a result of that. And it gives us perseverance. Verse 4, that perseverance finish its work. There's a work that perseverance does in us. So that you may be what? Mature and complete. Not lacking anything. And so, counter to joy, 
when you face persecution. Count it a joy when you face a trial. Count it a joy when maybe you have an idea or a truth of God that begins to say, no, that's not true. And people tell us how backwards we are and what happens. No, you have to realize there is something going on in you even that brings about perseverance and brings about maturity and completeness so we may not be lacking in anything. So we have to realize if we run into obstacles, count it a joy. Second of all, here's an incredibly important principle for us. We do not use the weapons of this world. Okay, we don't use the weapons of this world. Why is that? Because these weapons of this world that we may want to use, which are belittling, putting other people down, shaming, making other people feel awful, we may just want to go to that and do that, but yet still we cannot use those same principles. First Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 says this. We are human. It acknowledges we're human. It acknowledges that we struggle. It acknowledges that it's going to be hard for us. But we do not wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapon. Not worldly weapon. To knock down the stronghold of human reasoning. And to destroy false arguments. Notice that when Paul is writing this, he realizes that the, the battles and difficulties are sometimes going to be in the midst of human reasoning, truth, as well as false arguments, truth. How does grace work in this? Verse 5. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So going back to your image bearing, one of the ways that we deal with this is not to use the weapons of this world to make sure that we ourselves are obeying Christ. Yeah, we're messed up. Every single one of us. But we're going on to God, godly living. We're going on to be more like Christ. And as we continue to obey Christ, that's what begins to be the weapon that we use. Obedience to God and holiness before the Father. That's what's needed. You're not going to win arguments. I'm not looking for you to win arguments. I'm looking for you to be faithful to God. That's what I believe God's called us to. So we go in that direction. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. In fact, if you want to go home and read all of Romans 12, awesome book. Also read Romans chapter 8. Oh, just read the whole book. But at any rate, uh, uh, Romans 12, Romans 8, great, great chapters on these things. I had to kind of like narrow it down as opposed to what verses I wanted to use today. But Romans 12, 9 and 10, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Notice that word. Sometimes in our culture we're saying, but hate, I agree, but hate what's wrong. Stand against injustice. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and to take delight in honoring each other. Making sure that we honor other people is essential. Romans 12, verse 21. Again, that whole chapter is fantastic. Go back and read it. But don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing what? See, evil isn't going to win. When we tend to go to the world standards, what the world's weapons are, that can turn evil if we're very careful. If we're not careful. We have to realize that evil is not conquered by doing evil again. Evil is conquered by doing good. And so we need that as we hold grace and truth together. And Luke 6, verses 27 to 29, what's it say? It says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. And if someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. You can see that these things hold true as well. How we respond to people who may not believe in us depends on what we do. We still hold grace and truth together. So what are some principles to follow as we stand for truth with grace? How do we represent a Christ when the attack could come heavy? First of all, we need to understand this. I'm going to use a word that probably I, I'm not too comfortable with, but if you get attacked, if you get to beat down, if you get to show in a way that is uh, like showing the door and saying, we just don't believe it, understand this, because we have a tendency, we have a tendency as humans to vilify those who are against us. Okay? Understand this. Attackers are not the enemy. They're the missionary. Let that one sink in. A lot of times when you get people who come against you, you want to just say, oh, they are such jerks. Aren't they such idiots? And we begin to name names to them. We keep going in different directions. And understand this, they are not the enemy. They are missionaries. They're who God has sent to execute the order of ministry for. 
See, God called us to be in this world and not of it. And it takes in many forms. Think of Mother Teresa as she served in India long ago. She stood in the midst of, of this place where people were dying left and right. And she saw them dying and needed to die with dignity. And so she went and she picked them up and brought them back to where she was. She took care of them. Archbishop Oscar Romero, who was down in, in, in Central America and was standing against the communist movement that was there with the gospel of Jesus Christ, ended up losing his life. But, but he stood there giving communion the sacraments of God, the peace of God is the most important thing. So understand ways that we may have arguments with are not the enemy and they're not the enemy. The enemy is Satan. And Satan wants to cause lots of troubles and lots of displays. He may be behind things, but the person is not Satan. Okay? It's really easy for him to, to mix that up and mix that up. Second thing is this. We've got to remember that God calls us to something higher, and there is a final glorification He wants to give to us. In other words, uh, 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 the championship is not here on this earth. Okay? Let me stop. What would you do? We had the Kentucky Derby yesterday. Okay? Anybody see the Kentucky I don't know. I didn't watch it, but I understand American Sparrow won. Whoever that is. That, well, whatever horse that is. Sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, and. Uh, Last night, we also had, uh, what, uh, whoever those boxers are, Mayweather and Pacquiao or whatever his name was. Uh, who won the fight? Mayweather? Okay, good deal. Fantastic. Good deal. Okay, that's great. That was, well, maybe not great, but still, uh, uh, that was a big fight. Lots of things that were happening there that we were in- interested about. Here in Indiana, we're usually concerned about basketball. We also had the NFL draft this week. Colts got some good players, maybe, so that's a good thing. And so those are a lot of things that we watch and see what's going on. we got to realize those events are not the true and the glory. See, First Peter 4, 14 to 16 says this, If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you'll be blessed. For the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it means not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. In other words, when you suffer, don't do things that are going to bring suffering upon you. Okay, don't do things that are not godly. Do, don't do things that are going to be damaging to other people. Don't do murder, stealing, making trouble, or, or prying to other people's affairs. Verse 16, but it is, to shame, it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. Are you willing to be called by His name? Because it may involve suffering in some way. And then last but not least, and this goes to, back to the sermon I talked about uh, earlier uh, last week. Remember that Jesus is the model. John 13, 12 to 17 that was read earlier, comes from the time of the upper room. In the time of the upper room, Jesus gathered with his disciples there, and it was customary to wash the feet again because you'd be sitting at a table. You want to have feet cleansed. You've been walking through with sandals and dirty, uh, dusty back roads with uh, donkey manure and all that sort of stuff all around you. You clean your feet before you sit at the table, you know? What your parents tell you now? Go wash your hands before you eat, right? Okay? Then they say, go wash your feet before you eat, okay? That was just kind of the way that it was. And Jesus, though, was the one who put on the uh, robe to wash the feet. And all the disciples said, no, don't, no, you can't do that. It's supposed to be someone else, some servant, not you. Jesus, though, washes the feet. And it says in John 13, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again, and he sat down and taught them. Do you understand what I was doing? I love this about Jesus. They often understood, do you understand what I what I was doing? And, and here's the deal. The disciples are probably sitting there like, I don't know. Okay? I mean, they, they really almost never got it, you know? So I'm like, Jesus, don't ask the question. They don't get it anyway. Just go and go with the answer. But he always asks the question. Oftentimes, simply that means a question. Do you understand what I was doing? And what he's doing in your life? So Jesus says, do you understand what I was doing? Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, that's what I am. I am those things. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash your feet. We're called to bring others by washing their feet. Okay? We're called to bring truth and know the truth and have the truth in our hearts and develop our minds and hearts to see the truth. But we live the truth out by as our Lord and Master did, washing our feet. 
Now, don't go out there and start yanking seeds off people, okay? You'll get arrested just to let you know. Pastor tells me to do it. Okay, but instead, we meet people in their place of need. We serve them where they are. He says, do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. He's saying, I'm coming here to do this in a way. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing it. You see what you're called to do? You are called to do these things. You're called to please not the world around you. You're called to please an audience of one. And that's Jesus. That's where we stand here as people. I, I pray this, that we as a church, that you as a Christian, that all of us would be known for how we love and serve and not for what we're about. Okay? When we live in that way, we'll still be identified with Christ. We'll still know the truth. The truth will still abide, and we have to know the truth. You have to utilize the spiritual truth to be able to discern what's happening there. But when you love and serve, we'll be known for how we love and serve, and not just known for how and what we're doing. It's not an easy thing, but I do believe it's what God has called us to do. For me, I wanted to be committed to godliness and holiness, and I want Jesus to be my teacher and teach us the way. During the time of our closing song, uh, I just would like you to think, how can I represent God well? How can I handle grace and truth well? How can I live in a way where people see grace in my life? How can I live in a way where maybe I need to learn more truth? Maybe I need to understand truth better. Maybe I need to be better at discerning what that is. Think of which way you're in. Are you in a place that needs to show more grace to the world? Or are you in a place that says, I need to continue to learn more truth? of what it means. And then make a commitment toward that of learning truth, of serving with grace and love, and making sure you always keep those together to teach how you're supposed to do it. Let's pray. God, thanks for uh, giving us time here. Lord, teach us what it means to live by your truth, to understand it. Help us to hold your word deeply in our hearts daily. Help our prayers daily to let your Holy Spirit work in us. And Lord, as we continue to do those things daily, I pray that we would present and serve in a way that represents Christ well in the world. And keep us as pillars of love and do the love and service we do as we help show the truth that God loves people and wants to bring them to a new place of life. We ask this all in the name.